Okie dokie. So when last we left off with Francis McComber, turns out that um, our titular character, Francis McComber, is on a hunting expedition in Africa led by Wilson the White Hunter. Um, he's there with his wife, Margot, and it appears that McComber that morning proved himself to be a bit of a coward, if we don't recall. And um, his wife, Margot, seems to be getting a lot of pleasure out of kind of needling him about this. And um, it's making things for Wilson a little uncomfortable as we pick up. So we're going to start right here, if you will. So Robert Wilson thought to himself, she is giving him a ride, isn't she? Or do you suppose that's her idea of putting up a good show? How should a woman act when she discovers her husband is a bloody coward? She's jam cruel, but they're all cruel. They govern, of course, and to govern one has to be cruel sometimes. Still, I've seen enough of their damn terrorism. Have some more land, he said to her politely. That afternoon, late, Wilson and Macomber went out in the motor car with the native driver and the two gun bearers. Mrs. Macomber stayed in the camp. It was too hot to go out, she said, and she was going with them early in the morning. As they drove off, Wilson saw her, standing under the big tree, looking pretty rather than beautiful in her faintly rosy khaki, her dark hair drawn back over her forehead and gathered in a knot low on her neck, her face as fresh, he thought, as though she were in England. She waved to them as the car went off through the swale of high grass and curved around through the trees into the small hills of the orchid bush. In the orchid bush, they found a herd of impala, and leaving the car, they stalked one old ram with long, widespread horns, and Macomber killed it with a very credible shot that knocked the buck down at a good two hundred yards and sent the herd off bounding wildly and leaping over one another's backs in long, leg-drawn-up leaps as unbelievable and as floating as those one makes sometimes in dreams. It was a good shot, Wilson said. They had a small target. Is it a worthwhile head? Macomber asked. It's excellent, Wilson told him. Shoot like that, you'll have no trouble. Do you think we'll find buffalo tomorrow? There's a good chance of it. They feed out early in the morning, and with luck we may catch them in the open. I'd like to clear away that lion business, Macomber said. It's not very pleasant to have your wife see you do something like that. I should think it would be even more unpleasant to do it, Wilson thought. Wife or no wife. We ought to have talk about it, having done it. But he said, oh, I wouldn't think about it anymore. Anyone could be upset by his first lion. It's all over. But that night, after dinner, in a whiskey and soda by the fire before going to bed, as Francis Macomber lay in his cot, with the mosquito bar over him, and listened to the night noises, it was not all over. It was neither all over, nor was it beginning. It was there exactly as it happened, with some parts of it indelibly em emphasized, and he was miserably ashamed at it. But more than shame, he felt cold now, a hollow fear in him. The fear was still there like a cold, slimy hollow in all the emptiness where once his confidence had been, and it made him feel sick. It was still there with him now. It had started the night before, when he had wakened and heard the lion roaring up somewhere along the river. All right, so at this point here, we are now going back to the night before, and we're going to see what happened that day with the lion. <clears throat> it was a deep sound. And at the end, there was a sort of coughing grunt that made him seem just outside the tent. And when Francis Macomber woke in the night to hear it, he was afraid. He could hear his wife breathing quietly asleep. There was no one to tell he was afraid, nor to be afraid with him. And lying alone, he did not know the Somali proverb that says a brave man is always frightened three times by a lion. When he first sees his track, when he first hears him roar, and when he first confronts him. Then, while they were eating breakfast by lantern light out on the dining tent, before the sun was up, the lion roared again, and Francis thought he was just at the edge of camp. Sounds like an old-timer, Robert Wilson said, looking up from his kippers and coffee. Listen to him cough. Is he very close? My or so upstream. Will we see him? Will he have a look? Does his roaring carry far? It sounds as though he were right in camp. Yeah, it carries hell of a long way, said Robert Wilson. Strange the way it carries. I hope he's a shootable cat. The boy said there was a very big one there about. If I get a shot, where should I hit him? Macomber asked. To stop him. 
In the shoulders, Wilson said. In the nick, if you can make it. Shoot the bone. Break him down. I hope I can place it properly, McComber said. Yeah, you shoot very well, Wilson told him. Take your time. Make sure of him. The first one is in the one the first one in is the one that counts. What range will it be? Can't tell. Lion has something to say about that. Won't shoot him unless it's close enough so you can make sure. At under a hundred yards, Comber asked. Wilson looked at him quickly. Hundreds about Roy. You might have to take him a bit under. Shouldn't chance a shot at much over that. A hundred's a decent range. You can hit him wherever you want at that. Yeah, here comes the Memsaheep. Good morning, she said. Are we going after that lion? As soon as you deal with your breakfast, Wilson said. How are you feeling? Marvelous, she said. I'm very excited. I'll just go and see that everything is ready. Wilson went off, and as he left, the lion roared again. Noisy beggar, Wilson said. We'll put a stop to that. What's the matter, Francis? His wife asked him. Nothing, Macomber said. Yes, there is, she said. What are you upset about? Nothing, he said. Tell me. She looked at him. Don't you feel well? It's that damned roaring, he said. It's been going on all night, you know. Well, why didn't you wake me? She said. I'd have loved to hear it. <sighs> Got to kill the damn thing, Macomber said miserably. Well, that's what you're out here for, isn't it? Yeah, but I'm nervous. Hearing the thing roar gets on my nerves. Well then, as Wilson said, kill him and stop his roaring. Yes, darling, said Francis Macomber. Sounds easy, doesn't it? You're not afraid, are you? Of course not. But I'm nervous from hearing him roar all night. You'll kill him marvelously, she said. I know you will. I'm awfully anxious to see you do it. Finish your breakfast and we'll be starting. It's not even light yet, she said. This is a ridiculous hour. All right, so what we're seeing here, <clears throat> soul situation here, his wife is really antagonizing him, trying to make him feel more of a fool. Not a super healthy relationship, I would say. Um, definitely reflective of Hemingway's views of women. Just then, as the lion roared in a deep-chested moaning, suddenly guttural ascending vibration that seemed to shake the air and ended in a heavy sigh with a deep-chested grunt. He sounds almost here, Macomber's wife said. Oh, my God, said Macomber. I hate that damn noise. It's very impressive. Impressive? It's frightful. Robert Wilson came up then, carrying his short, ugly, shockingly big board, five of five gibbs, and grinning. Come on, he said. Your gun bear is your spring field and the big gun. Everything's in the car. You have your solids? Yes. I'm ready, Mrs. Macomber said. Must make him stop that racket, Wilson said. You go in front. The MC and I can sit in the back here with me. They climbed into the motor car, and in the faint gray daylight, moved up off the river through the trees. Macomber opened the breech of his rifle and saw that he had metal-cased bullets. He shut the bolt and put the rifle on safety. He saw his hand was trembling. He felt in his pocket for more cartridges and moved his finger over the cartridges in the loops of his tunic front. He turned back to where Wilson sat in the rear of the doorless, box-bodied motor beside his wife, then both grinning with excitement, and Wilson leaned forward and whispered, See the beds dropping. Means the old boy's left his kill. On the far bank of the stream, Macomber could see above the trees vultures circling and plummeting down. Chances are I'll come back to drink along here, Wilson whispered. Before he goes to lay up, keep an eye out. They were driving slowly along the high bank of the stream, which here cut deeply to its boulder-filled bed, and they wound in and out through the big trees as they drove. Macomber was watching the opposite bank when he felt Wilson take a hold of his arm, and the car stopped. There he is, he whispered. Heading to the right. Get out and take him. He's a marvelous lion. Macomber saw the lion now. He was standing almost broadside, his great head up and turned toward them. The early morning breeze that blew toward them was just stirring in his dark mane, and the lion looked huge, silhouetted on the rise of the bank in the gray morning light, his, soldier, his shoulders heavy, his barrel of a body bulking smoothly. How far is he? asked Macomber, raising his rifle. About seventy-five. Get out and take him. Why not shoot from where I am? You don't shoot them from the cause. He heard Wilson saying, get out. He's not going to stay there all day. Macomber stepped out of the curved opening at the far side of the front seat 
and on to the step and down onto the ground. The lion still stood looking majestically and coolly toward this object that his eyes only showed in silhouette, bulking like some super rhino. So now we're going to kind of switch to the perspective of the lion right here. There was no man smell carried toward him, and he watched the object, moving his great head a little from side to side, and then watching the object, not afraid but hesitating before going down the bank to drink with such a thing opposite him, he saw a man figure detach itself from it, and he turned his heavy head and swung away toward the cover for the trees, as he heard a cracking crash and felt the slam of a two twenty grain solid bullet that bit his flank and ripped in sudden hot scolding nausea through his stomach. He trotted, heavy, big-footed, swinging, wounded, lull-bellied, toward the trees, toward the tall grass and cover. And the crash came again to go past him, ripping the air apart. And then it crashed again, and he felt the blow as it hit his lower ribs and ripped on through, blood sudden hot and frothy in his mouth, and he galloped toward the high grass where he could crouch and not be seen and make them bring the crashing thing close enough so he could make a rush and get the man that held it. Macomber had not thought how the lion felt as he got out of his car. He only knew his hands were shaking, and as he walked away from the car, it was almost impossible for him to make his legs move. They were stiff in the thighs, but he could feel the muscles fluttering. He raised the rifle, sighted on the junction of the lion's head and shoulders, and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened, though he pulled until he thought his finger would break. And then he knew he had the safety on. And as he lowered the rifle to move the safety over, he moved another frozen pace forward, and the lion, seeing his silhouette now clear of the silhouette of the car, turned and started off at a trot. And as Macomber fired, he heard a wonk that meant that the bullet was home, but the lion kept on going. Macomber shot again, and everyone saw the bullet throw a spout of dirt beyond the trotting lion. He shot again, remembering to lower his aim, and they all heard the bullet hit, and the lion went into a gallop and was in the tall grass before he had the bolt pushed forward. Macomber stood there feeling sick at his stomach, his hands that held the Springfield still cocked, shaking, and his wife and Robert Wilson were standing by him. Beside him, too, were the two gun bearers, chattering in Wakamba. "'I hit him,' said Macomber. "'I hit him twice!' "'You gut shot him and you hit him some way forward,' Wilson said without enthusiasm. The gun bearers looked very grave. They were silent now. "'Got some trouble ahead here.' "'You may have killed him,' went on Wilson." We'll, wait. we'll have to wait for a while before going in to find out. Well, what do you mean? Let him get sick before we follow him up. Oh, said Macomber. He's a hell of a fine lion, Wilson said cheerfully. He's gotten into a bad place, though. Why is it bad? Can't see him until you're on him. Oh, said Macomber. Well, come on, said Wilson. The memps heap stay here in the car. Go to have a look at them in the blood spore. Stay here, Margot, Macomber said to his wife. His mouth was very dry, and it was hard for him to talk. Why? she asked. Wilson says to. We're going to have a look, Wilson said. You say here. You can see even better from here. All right. Wilson spoke in Swahili to the driver. He nodded and said, yes, Buana. And then they went down the steep bank and across the stream, climbing over and around the boulders and up the other bank, pulling up by some projecting roots, and along it until they found where the lion had been trotting when Macomber first shot. There was dark blood on the short grass, and the gun bearers pointed out the grass stems that ran away behind the river bank and trees. What do we do? asked Macomber. Not much choice, said Wilson. We can't bring the car over. Bank's too steep. We'll let him stiefen up a bit. Then you and I go in and have a look for him. Can't we just set the grass on fire? said Macomber. Too green. Can't we send beaters? Wilson looked at him appraisingly. Of course we can, he said. But it's just a touch murderous. You see, we know the lion's wounded. You can drive an unwounded lion, he'll move on ahead of a noise. But a wounded lion's going to charge. You can't see him until you ride on him. He'll make himself perfectly flat and cover that you wouldn't think would hide a hair. And you can't very well send boys in there in that sort of a show. Somebody's bound to get mauled. What about gun bearers? Eh, they'll go in with us. It's their showery. You see, they signed on for it. They don't look too happy, though, do they? I don't want to go in there, said Macomber. This is going to be important later. It was out before he knew that he had said it. No, neither do I, said Wilson very cheerily. Really no choice, though. And then, as an afterthought, he glanced at Macomber and saw suddenly how he was trembling and the pitiful look on his face. 
You don't have to go in, of course. That's what I'm hired for, you know? That's why I'm so expensive. You mean you'd go in by yourself? Why not leave him in there? Robert Wilson, whose entire occupation had been with the lions and the problems he presented, and who had not been thinking about Macomber except to note that he was rather windy, suddenly felt as though he had opened the wrong door in a hotel and seen something shameful. What is that shameful thing that Wilson saw, do you think? That's a question to ask yourself. What do you mean? Why not just leave him? You mean pretend to ourselves he hasn't been heat? No, just drop it. It isn't done. Why not? Well, for one thing, he's certain to be suffering. For another, someone else might run onto him. I see. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do with it. Well, I'd like to, said Macomber. I'm just scared, you know. I'll go ahead when you go in, Wilson said, with Congoni tracking. Keep behind me and a little to one side. Chances are we'll hear him growl. If we see him, we'll both shoot. Don't worry about anything. I'll keep you backed up. As a matter of fact, you know, you perhaps you'd better not go home. Might be much better. Why don't you go over and join the Mem Sahib while I just go get it done with? So basically what he's doing here is calling him like a little girl. Go sit with the ladies while the men go take care of it, so to speak. No, I want to go. All right, said Wilson. Don't go in if you don't want to. It's my showery now, you know. I want to go, said Macomber. They sat under a tree and smoked. Want to go back and speak to the Memsahib while we're waiting? Wilson asked. No. I'll just sit back and tell him to be patient. Good, said Macomber. He sat there, sweating under his arms, his mouth dry, his stomach hollow feeling, wanting to find courage to tell Wilson to go on and finish off the line without him. He could not know that Wilson was furious because he had not noticed the state he was in earlier and it sent him back to his wife. While he sat there, Wilson came up. Oh, you have your big gun, said Wilson. Take it. We've given him time, I think. Come on. McComber took the big gun, and Wilson said, Keep you on me in about five yards to the right. Do exactly as I tell you. And then he spoke in Swahili to the two gun bearers, who looked at a picture of gloom. Let's go, he said. Could I have a drink of water? McComber asked. Wilson spoke to the older gun bearer, who wore a canteen on his belt, and the man unbuckled it, unscrewed the top, and handed it to Macomber, who took it noticing how heavy it seemed and how hairy and shoddy the felt covering was in his hand. He raised it to drink and looked ahead at the high grass, with the flat top trees behind it. A breeze was blowing toward them, and the grass rippled gently in the wind. He looked at the gun bearer, and he could see that the gun bearer was suffering, too, with fear. Let me see how many minutes we have here. Oh, we got plenty of time still. Thirty-five yards into the grass, the big lion lay, flattened out along the ground. His ears were back, and his only movement was a slight twitching up and down of his long black tufted tail. He had turned to bay as soon as he had reached his cover, and he was sick with the wound through his full belly, and weakening with the wound through his lungs that brought a thin, foamy red to his mouth each time he breathed. His flanks were wet and hot, and flies were on the little openings the solid bullets had made in his tawny hide, and his big yellow eyes, narrowed with hate, looked straight ahead only blinking when the pain came as he breathed and his claws dug into the soft baked earth all of him pain sickness hatred all of his remaining strength was tightening into an absolute concentration for a rush he could hear the men talking and he waited gathered all of himself into this preparation for a charge as soon as the men would come into the grass as he heard their voices his tail stiffened to twitch up and down and then as they came to the edge of the grass he made a coughing grunt and charged Kungoni, the old gun bearer, in the lead watching the blood spore, Wilson watching the grass for any movement, his big gun ready, the second gun bearer looking ahead and listening. Macomber close to Wilson, his rifle cocked. They had just moved into the grass when Macomber heard the blood choking coughing grunt and saw the swishing rush of the grass. And the next thing he knew, he was running, running wildly in panic in the open, running toward the stream. He heard the carawang of Wilson's big rifle, and again in a second crashing carawang, and turning saw the lion, horrible looking now, with half of his head seeming to be gone, crawling toward Wilson in the edge of the tall grass, while the red-faced man worked the belt of the short ugly rifle, aimed carefully as another blasting carawang came from the muzzle, and the crawling, heavy, yellow bulk of the lion stiffened, and the huge mutilated head slid forward, and Macomber, Standing by himself in the clearing where he had run, 
holding a loaded rifle, while two men and a hunter looked back at him in contempt, and he knew the lion was dead. He came toward Wilson, his tallness all seeming a naked reproach, and Wilson looked at him and said, Want to take pictures? No, he said. That was all anybody said until they reached the motor car. And then Wilson had said, Hell of a fine lion. Boys will skin him out. Might as well stay here in the shade. Macomber's wife had not looked at him, nor he at her. And he had sat by her in the back seat with Wilson sitting in the front. Right? So, something here. You'll notice now, before, Macomber was sitting in the front seat and Wilson was sitting in the back. And now those kind of roles have changed. So there's a symbolic message there. Why is he sitting in the back now, you know? Once he reached over and had taken his wife's hand without looking at her, and she removed her hand from his. Ouch. Looking across the stream to where the gun bearers were skinning out the lion, he could see that she had been able to see the whole thing. Remember earlier when Wilson said, you can see even better from where you are? That was a little bit of foreshadow. While they sat there, his wife had reached forward and put her hand on Wilson's shoulder. He turned, and she leaned forward over the low seat and kissed him on the mouth. Oof, ouch. Well, I say, said Wilson, going redder than his natural red-baked color. Mr. Robert Wilson, she said. The beautiful, red-faced Mr. Robert Wilson. And then she sat down beside Macomber again and looked away across the stream to where the lion lay with uplifted, white-muscled, tendon-marked, naked forearms and white-bloating belly as the men flushed away the skin. And finally, the gun-bearer brought the skin over, wet and heavy, climbed in behind it, rolling it up before they got in, and the motor car started. No one said anything more until they were back at camp. And this is where we're going to stop for today. All right, stay tuned for part three of Francis McComber.